In this video, I will explain how high-rises, also known as skyscrapers, are designed and constructed. High-rises are the shelters of modern day life. And stay until the end to find out one thing that you would have never thought about that engineers do to design these very tall high-rise buildings. High-rises are the modern-day shelter of modern-day life and work in today's modern society. People work, live, and reside in these tall structures in the sky. Have you ever wondered how it is possible for those massive structures made of what looks like glass, steel, and concrete to stand hundreds of feet tall in the air without breaking in half and falling down to the ground? Well, there's some smart engineering that goes into designing these structures to prevent just that and in this video I will show you how. I've been practicing structural engineering for over 12 years and in today's video I will explain how skyscrapers, also known as high-rises, are designed. It starts something like this. The process from inception to complete building could be quite complicated but astonishingly in some cases only takes a few years to build a skyscraper. This is due to the enormous efforts of teams of architects, engineers and contractors and many more construction workers and consultants to put those tall buildings together but we'll break it down and make it look as simple as going to the grocery store to buy yourself groceries yes designing a skyscraper could be that simple the first part of the process is to secure funding and budgeting for how much the building would cost just like before you go to the grocery store you come up with your budget for that day of shopping for how much you're going to spend I'm sure we all do that or try at least before we give up and buy those cookies or filet mignon that we've been craving. Believe it or not, securing funding for building an enormous skyscraper is by far the most difficult. In many cases, building tall isn't very economical. That is why we don't see them popping up in downtown areas every day. Generally, you see skyscrapers being built in booming economic times or when funding is easily available and abundance such as in the 1920s and 1970s and 80s during the savings and loans era. As you can tell, this is important because it takes takes tremendous amount of money and resources to build one of these tall buildings. The next step in putting up a giant high-rise together after planning stage is to design the building itself. That is when the architects and engineers bring their heads together to come up with a conceptual design of how tall the tower needs to be and how tall it can be. The demands on the foundations and the rough building floor plan configuration and overall shape. Our architects usually like to go all crazy with some of their ideas ideas, but that's when we have engineers like us to hit the brakes before taking it too far. The construction material choices that are widely available out there aren't that many, unlike the choices you have at your local grocery store. Those materials are like the ingredients for a recipe. As an engineer, all the materials you really have to work with are steel and concrete. That's it. Can you believe it? That's all we as engineers have to work with to engineer those giants in the sky. Now, don't let that fool you because there are many ways of how those two simple materials can be used in variety of combinations. Think of the Sydney Opera House concrete shell structure or the truss frame Eiffel Tower, which by the way, I have a video down in the description that you can watch. Combining those building materials is where the real creativity and ingenuity comes into play. So let's look at how that's done. Let's start with the basics first. The most important system of a high rise is its gravity system, which in layman terms means the floor system and building columns that carry the floor loads down to the ground. One type of gravity system is comprised of concrete column and concrete flat plate floors, which is quite an efficient system if you really need to take advantage of the floor to floor height. This means that the structure of the floor takes less space as the building height increases and therefore allowing for more square footage to be utilized in a shorter building. This is very common type of gravity system used in many New York skyscrapers, for example. Post-tension slabs are more desired in high-rise buildings over mildly reinforced concrete slabs, which generally need to be a few inches thicker over the post-tension slab alternative. Why post-tension slabs, you might ask? As an example, if you have a 40-story building and you can save only 3 inches of floor space, that means that by level 40, or this equates to 10 feet, 
extra height that you can work with, which is an extra floor of space which could be sold or leased for the building owner. So that is one of the main reasons why post-tension slabs are preferred over other gravity floor systems. I will cover post-tension slabs and structures in another video and explain how they really work. So subscribe to learn more in the future videos. Now having this extra floor could be highly desirable in high demand real estate markets such as San Francisco or New York where adding an extra floor or a couple of floors in a same height building could be highly sought after. But like every too good to be true story, there is a catch. But what is the catch with concrete flat plate construction? Why aren't all high rises constructed that way? Well, one reason could be that the higher weight of the structure is prohibitive on the foundations. Or the larger weight of the concrete floors up the height of the building is too punishing to the lateral system or could be too heavy for the foundation systems to handle, which I will explain coming up. If the weight of the building is a concern, another popular system that could be much lighter weight is a composite beam and steel deck floor system with steel columns down to the foundations. That requires requires a structural steel frame typically comprised of I-beams, also known as white flange beams, and steel deck that then gets filled with thin layer of concrete or even better, lightweight concrete. Yes, there is such thing as lightweight concrete, just like 1% milk, a lightweight option that you buy at your grocery store. The floor deck thickness in steel frame high rises is typically 5 to 6 inches thick. Another benefit of steel frame structures is their ability to prefabricate most of the building structure off-site and put it together on the building site like Legos, which speeds up the construction and requires less construction labor. Labor costs in countries like the US is quite expensive compared to the rest of the world. That is why most buildings in China are made of cast in place concrete compared to the US. I will let you figure out why. The steel floor structure can also be lighter weight compared to the concrete floor counterpart, which could be greater benefit if the building is in a high seismic area, such as in Los Angeles or San Francisco, where every ounce of weight up the building height matters. The heavier the building up its height, the more stronger lateral structural system it will require. The design of the gravity system of a high-rise building is usually done using engineering software, which saves engineering engineers time. Structural engineers use software such as Bentley Ram Structural Systems or CSI ETABs for steel frame buildings or ADAP for post-tension slab building designs. Software could help speed up and simplify the analysis if used properly and supervised by experienced engineers. You could run into a lot of trouble when relying too much on software or if software is used improperly, which could result in buildings being designed incorrectly, which I will cover in a separate future video. So after the gravity system of the building is selected, it is time to look at the lateral system of this high-rise building. This is by far the most important part of a high-rise building that helps it stand tall and rigid under forces of nature, such as wind and earthquakes. Majority of conventional high-rises have a structural lateral system comprised of reinforced concrete cores that are also referred to as shear walls, with its gravity system tied and relying on them for support. Another high-rise lateral system are brace frames, such as the Bank of China Tower. Think of the lateral system of a building like a drunk Russian holding their wife trying to walk in the snow. One of them has to be sober and standing up, or else they both fall down. The lateral system is the wife who is well built and thin looking and the drunk Russian is the heavy gravity system with its shaky legs. But seriously, back to the lateral system of a high rise building. The concrete core helps stabilize the floor plate of the building laterally for wind and seismic forces. The concrete core is very efficient for the simple reason that it adds stiffness to the building. Just like how a trunk of a tree adds stiffness and and is able to support the branches and the crown of the tree, which looks massive in comparison to its trunk. Engineers create building analysis models to analyze the lateral system of the building and apply the code required lateral forces that nature creates such as wind and seismic. Think of millions of years of evolution that created tree branches and how they get narrower and thinner higher up you get. Nature is the perfect engineer and designer, so we engineers use our 
our ingenuity by copying it, knowingly or unknowingly. Well, some trees are a little funky, but we'll leave that up to nature to decide. So how engineers decide on how thick and how big do they need to make concrete core of a high rise? Simple. Nature creates wind and shakes us sometimes during history, and some scientists record these events generally over the past 100 years. And those scientists and researchers simply simplify these events for us, engineers, and put them in an engineering language, in the building codes, for us to decipher and apply to buildings we design. This may sound like children's game of telephone for those of us that grew up before the internet. At the end of the day, this is far from a clean cut process and there is a lot of engineering judgment that goes into every building's design. The code is like a recipe book that you need to follow to cook a tasty meal. But if you follow that recipe precisely, you will never get the same taste until you repeat it over and over again and through experience, you intuitively know how much of each ingredient you need to add to make it taste amazing. Sometimes a little more salt could ruin a whole meal and that's why in my opinion, engineering of a building is a form of art. The architects and engineers are the people that execute the recipe and the contractors are the chefs that do the hard lifting and get it built. If you get hungry during this video, feel free to stop and get yourself a snack. Now that we have the gravity and lateral system of a skyscraper or high rise covered, let's look at the foundations. But have you asked yourself, how are skyscrapers supported on the ground? Well, if you popped your head below the ground, you will see pile foundations that come in many variations. Those piles are like sticks into the ground that carry the load deeper into naturally compacted layers of earth over millions of years. The large building gravity forces from all that steel and concrete are dispersed deep into the ground and through end bearing and skin friction of those piles on their sides. Piles are also called deep foundations foundation systems, which is probably because they go deep into the ground. This is by far the most common foundation system used for high rises. But there is another type of foundation that also works for high rises, which is a very thick mat foundation that sits at the bottom of a building that works as a pendulum at the very bottom. In some cases, that foundation could be as thick as 10 feet thick. This type of foundation system is chosen for various reasons, but one of them is the risk for liquefaction. Bedrock is too deep and therefore too costly to build deep foundations. The Transamerica building in San Francisco, for example, was built on a nine foot thick mat foundation. We still have to cover most obvious part of skyscrapers and that is the exterior skin, which is another important part of the design that is usually one of the most expensive part of the building and gives the skyscrapers its distinct look. Sometimes this cost could be more than the structure itself. Now now that we have filled up the grocery cart with groceries, it's time to pay. And at the same time, the cost of a skyscraper could be through the roof. I mean, the sky is the limit for how much you can spend on a skyscraper. Or sometimes a high rise building could cost hundreds of millions on the low end and multiple billions on the high end, depending on their location, such as New York or San Francisco and cost of labor. For example, Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, which is 1.6 million square feet of office space coming at a whopping $1.1 billion, which is nearly $687 per square foot. That's a whole lot of milk and eggs for your groceries store example. But that's not too bad for a building in a high seismic region such as San Francisco compared to New York. In comparison, Three World Trade Center, which is comparable in height, costs about $2.75 billion and it houses 2.2 million square feet, which is about double at $1,230 dollars per square foot compared to the Salesforce Tower. A real bargain. Those buildings are a great fit if you're a Wall Street up and coming startup looking for the most magnificent office space to shelter your highly demanding millennial employees. Now that we have an idea of the chunk of change required to get one of these skyscrapers off the ground, let's go home and cook ourselves a meal. If you like this content and this video, then subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss future video uploads. Click on the subscribe button below. Thank you for watching.